welcome to the Institute for Human Sciences. Uh, my name is Ivan Veyvoda. I'm a permanent fellow here, and I run the Europe's Futures uh, project, of which this is a part. Uh, I'm very happy uh, on this occasion because what we're doing tonight, as you saw from the announcement, is to launch uh, this book um, on Brexit that's published by Passagen Verlag here, and it's the result of a cooperation that the Institute has with the Passagen Verlag. And in addition, this book is the result of an additional cooperation uh, with the Europe's Futures Project here at the Institute and uh, with the Passagen Verlag. And of course, the Europe's Futures Project is a strategic partnership that we have with the Erste Stiftung here in Vienna. Um, well, when we began working on this book, which was actually in March last year, some of you may have been at the Burgtheater on a Sunday in March when we had a debate uh, entitled Brexit Deal or No Deal. And we said, well, we'll have the book out hopefully by the end of the year and maybe Brexit will be over. And we were wondering, you know, will the book be relevant or not? And <laughs> will it just be a historical account? But as the uh, saying goes, it is a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> we are still far away. Uh, the new thing is, of course, is that we have an election in the United Kingdom on the 12th of uh, December. And I'm very happy that Mary Caldor, uh, our friend and colleague, uh, professor at the <coughs> London School of Economics, uh, worked at the Center for Global Governance and uh, has conducted many projects and is one of the preeminent uh, theorists and experts on what are called the new wars, on human security and many other matters, but also a civic activist in the full sense of the word for many, many years, part of the end nuclear disarmament movement, worked with uh, E.P. Thompson, in Britain, many other people was very active in helping uh, civic activists during the breakdown wars of former Yugoslavia, uh, many other parts of the world as well, and uh, is someone who sort of combines the best of academia and of civic activism and is a friend and a fellow here at, at the IWM uh, for the past several years. Uh, she is the only author of the nine authors that we have in this edited volume uh, that was free to come uh, at this time, so we're very lucky. Um, the other nine authors, and I will uh, name them uh, in order of their appearance in the book, is uh, the first is Gaspar Miklos Tamas from Hungary, Misha Glenny, uh, Fintan O'Toole, uh, Pankaj Mishra, uh, Tessa Shishkovic, who is a, a journalist here from Vienna, whom you may know. Um, Calypso Nikolaidis, a professor from uh, Oxford. Uh, Timothy Garten-Ash, also at Oxford, and Timothy Snyder. Um, we might be joined by Gaspar Miklos Tamas a little later, who is teaching at the Central European University that's moved here to, uh, to Vienna. But I'd really like to stress that this, uh, as any project uh, of an edited volume, is a team effort. And I'd really like to single out two of my colleagues here at IWM, uh, uh, Katarina Hasevind and uh, Evangelos Karadjanis, without whom this book would not have been uh, possible given their uh, translating and editorial uh, efforts, which were uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. And so the result is really, uh, uh, of course, apart from the authors, uh, thanks to their engagement and, once again, of, of Passage and Verlag. Uh, I'd also like, before we, we begin, uh, Mary is here uh, also because tomorrow night she's giving a keynote speech at the event called uh, the Utopische Raum, uh, that's part of the Alte Schmiede uh, Cultural Center, uh, and she will be giving a, a, a keynote lecture called European Utopias from below and as well a, a small plug-in that on Sunday morning at the Alte Schmiede, Europe's Futures will be present uh, on a debate called Transnationalism or Barbarism uh, with uh, Holly Case, uh, Nicola Milanese and Yoti Mistry. So, um, 
All this uh, proves that uh, cultural and intellectual life in Vienna is very intense and that uh, obviously one cannot get to everything, but I think these are worthwhile events. We, uh, with Mary, uh, decided that we would make this a conversation uh, to make it as lively as possible. And I do have to uh, note that we are live streaming uh, this event as we do with many of our events and they will be up on the YouTube channel of, of IWM. So if you didn't catch everything, there's a chance to go back to it later on. Um, we will, after our initial conversation, open it up uh, to, uh, to your questions and answers and comments. And we will have to finish promptly at uh, 7.30 because of obligations that, that uh, Mary has uh, later on. So again, I'm grateful for your uh, presence. Uh, obviously, as you see, the books are here. Uh, I hope you will be uh, motivated to, to buy them. If I stand corrected, but I do believe this is the first edited volume on Brexit in the German language. Uh, so if anyone knows about a book that's done before on, in edited version, please let me know. But I think we do have a first here in Vienna at the Institute with Passage and Verlag. Mary, <laughs> after this longish introduction, um, I thought we'd begin uh, by very briefly uh, giving a bit of the prehistory. Why was it at all that we had this referendum in your country? I will begin with that, but I was thinking as you were talking, there's a very funny cartoon in Britain which shows, it, it takes place in the 2090s and it shows the British Prime Minister going to Brussels and it says, this is the ancient tradition of asking for an extension. <laughs> so, you know, when you said you thought it would be over by now, who knows how many more extensions we'll be asking for. As, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the more the merrier. So why did we get into this mess? It was an internal Conservative Party debate. Mm -hmm. Uh, there always was a strong wing of the Conservative Party that was very Eurosceptic <coughs> and very nationalistic. And I think David Cameron thought he was being very clever by saying he would hold a referendum which he was very confident he would win and he thought that would be the end of it. And uh, he didn't win. And I think what it exposed was a huge democratic crisis in Britain. I think that's what really made it into such a big thing. It exposed a huge, it created a very strong polarization in Britain. The, the, the people who campaigned uh, for leave, and this comes from, from several sources and maybe you can confirm it, people who campaigned for remain and went into leave areas before the referendum, said that, that the leavers uh, didn't believe that actually they would win. And when asked the question, well, if you do win, uh, you know, what, what will happen? How would you go about it? They had no clue as to what, what the next steps were. Was that your feeling? And secondly, just why is it that David Cameron and these people who called the referendum did not campaign more convincingly uh, to remain? Or did they just sort of were they on a sort of autopilot? It's very, very interesting. First of all, yes, I think they didn't have a clue what leave meant. Nobody had a clue what leave meant. Even now, nobody knows what leave means. <laughs> um, and that's what we've been arguing about for the last three years. But also, many of the people who voted leave did so because they were fed up with the status quo. They just wanted change. And I've talked to so many working class people who just, they didn't really know what they were uh, voting for. Uh, although I do think there was a strong undercurrent of racism, and I was saying that to you earlier. On Sunday, I went canvassing for the Labour Party, <laughs> and I went to a working class estate, and there were... In, on this street I canvassed, there were old, elderly, white working class, young immigrants and students. 
and the young immigrants and students were solidly labor. But the white working class just repeated like a mantra, uh, we want to get Brexit done, we don't like Corbyn. Uh, and I just thought they don't like the fact that their street is filled with immigrants and students. So I think there was a strong undercurrent of racism. Then your question, why didn't Remain? Remain didn't understand that there was such a, they were used to, if you like, the permissive consensus. They were used to winning elections and doing whatever they liked. They didn't understand there was such a deep undercurrent of dissatisfaction. And what I also feel is that the Remain campaign deliberately <coughs> marginalized anybody who was progressive or radical. <laughs> uh, they just wanted to campaign for the status quo. And they thought Britain is so successful, we're so rich, and they failed to take into account the fact that all of that success and richness is focused on London and the Southeast. And, you know, there are really great tragedies going on in large parts of Britain. The several of the essays, Gazi uh, Miklos Tamas, Panke Mishra, talk about the incompetence of the British ruling class. Would you say that that was the case before the referendum, or is that something that came out after the Leave vote came about? I think it was before the referendum. I think that politics has been hollowed out. I'm not sure whether that's also true of other countries, but I think what has been really striking over the last two decades, I would say, maybe, is that, you know, people, because of the way politics have become almost a technology, where you look at the opinion polls, you worry about focus groups, you capture the center, Anybody who really was ambitious in the sense of wanting to change society had in a way given up on politics. And I think what you saw was a generation of politicians who really had lost touch with ordinary people and who really weren't in it to change, but in it for careers. And I've seen that across all parties. And I would guess it's very similar in other countries too. I don't think it's just a British problem, but I definitely think there are very, there were, and now there's a whole new generation of political people who feel they have to get involved and who are really great. But I think there's been a generation of, re, of I mean, some of them were quite clever, but they came up as special advisors. They've never had any experience out in the real world, but they were career politicians, not people who wanted to change society. And is that your sort of deeper thought on the nature of politics that Brexit brought about? And obviously, as you say, it has broader ramifications in other countries. And then this issue of polarization. I mean, we see that in Israel. We see that in the US. Was the polarization exacerbated by uh, the whole Brexit debate after the referendum? What I feel is that what the Brexit referendum revealed was a very deep democratic crisis. And it's partly to do, it's to do with a lot of things. I mean, I just think we're in a historic moment when our political institutions are out of step with far reaching economic and social change that has taken place. So the democracy crisis is not just about the hollowing out of politics. That's part of the story. But part of the story is globalization. Part of the story is that actually, uh, you know, you, if you want to influence the decisions that affect your life, you can't do it at a national level because they're taken by, uh, by multinational companies or in financial markets. So part of it is globalization. Part of it is this technology of elections. Um, and part of it is, in a way, the routinization of the state and the excessive centralization of the state that I think has happened in a lot of places. So, you know, there's a huge and profound frustration 
at local levels, particularly in those areas that have been left behind by the decline of manufacturing and mining. Uh, there's just a huge sense of political frustration that nobody is listening, nobody cares. And is that what drove the classical working class labour voting people into the hands of Brexit party and, and conservatives? I think it is. And I, I mean, I do think it wasn't inevitable. <laughs> I do think if without Brexit, no doubt the democratic frustration would have been there. But I think the rise of English nationalism was not necessarily there. And I think what, so I think the polarization was, was brought about by the way the Leave vote really built on racist sentiment, built on English nationalist sentiment, uh, that then got somehow entrenched in the white working classes. It's not only the white working classes, some many rural middle class areas are also. And how much is the proverbial or metaphoric Polish plumber has to do with all this? The fact that Eastern Europeans as, uh, the Euro as they joined the European Union flooded not only the UK but Ireland, you know, the, the Poles, the Romanians, the the others, the fact that they were seen as taking away jobs. Well, they weren't, actually, and this is but quite interesting. But that was the perception, no? I mean, that in some the, quarters. I don't think, I mean, that was the rhetoric. Okay. I'm not sure it was the perception. I mean, one of the things I did after Brexit was, uh, which actually is how I start the essay in the book, was to organize a local Brexit project. <laughs> and First of all, the sort of hard Brexit areas were often not the areas of high immigration. But secondly, even where there was, I mean, one of the constituencies that we looked at, one of the local areas is a town called Mansfield that was always a mining area. And um, it shifted from Labour to Conservative in the 2017 elections. So what had happened there was that uh, there were very few immigrants. However, Sports Direct, which is an online retail um, company, decided to use some of the area uh, that had been vacated by the mines to establish its main warehouse in the UK, mm -hmm. in Mansfield. The jobs at zero our jobs, they're terribly badly paid. No British person wanted to do them. And so they have brought Poles, Romanians, Bulgarians into the city to do those jobs. Now, no, nobody in Mansfield wants to do those jobs. So it's <laughs> not that those jobs, and as, as our brilliant PhD student who wrote the report put it, it's more an objection to the new kind of economy than it is to an objection to immigration. So it's a, it's a mediated uh, exactly. rebellion exactly. Uh, where obviously the, the foreigner is seen as, as one that, that leads to this. The, well, the foreigner is associated mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. um, this new economy which nobody, no mm. British person mm. wants to participate yeah. in because the wages are too low, they regard themselves as skilled workers. Mm. Mm -hmm. And actually what was interesting was that what we did, we held group, we had di discussions among various stakeholders. We did it in ev all the places we went to. But in Mansfield, several people said immigration is a red herring. Uh, this is Explain this red herring to those of us who are not... It, it's yeah. a way of diverting attention. Okay. It's, not, it's not the real issue. The real issue here is the decline of skilled jobs. That's the mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the young people who do well go to university and they usually leave and they go south and they abandon Mansfield. <laughs> but the people who are left, they, they've run down the traditional apprenticeship schemes 
And so unless they're willing to do these zero hour jobs, they're jobless. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you the, the following question. It's very often seen that in the liberal or neoliberal age, whichever you want to call it, uh, politicians are very closely linked to big business. Yes. And yet, from what we know, the, the CBI, the Confederation of British Industries, has been very pro-Remain and has been quietly or less quietly saying even before the referendum and afterwards, this is not a good idea because of all the possible consequences of businesses leaving the UK, factories closing, you know, going within the single market area. What is it that happened in this, this joint? Why is it that politicians were not taking heed of this? Well, I think the more interesting question is, why was the city not more opposed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, because actually I think what's happened to Britain is that manufacturing has declined dramatically and our wealth depends on the city. And you would expect that the city would have been much more opposed. And if the city had been opposed, then I think it would have been incredibly difficult to do anything. But I think what's happening is, uh, if you like two things, I mean, one has been the rise of what you like, might call crony capitalism. The increasing contracting out culture of the state has meant that lots of people are making profits. Hence the huge debate in the current elections about buying off the NHS. You privatise and people get, your, your supporters get rich from it. <laughs> but the other thing is an increasing share of finance is somewhat dodgy. You know, it's Russian oligarchs, it's Syrian warlords, and there was a lot of interest in escaping regulatory rules. So there were a lot of the financial who were interested in Brexit as a way of reducing regulations. So basically decoupling from the EU would allow you, would allow Britain and the city in particular to actually go overboard on exactly. everything they were already doing. Exactly. That is exactly what I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you look at the current debates about deregulation and about making trade deals with the US, it's quite clear that that's what they're interested in. And uh, as you know, one of our American colleagues that we meet in Greece every summer said, actually, it's not deregulation, it's the rich regulating for themselves. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, let, let's move on to, to sort of an, another area. And uh, many of the authors here in, in the book, uh, Misha Glenny, uh, Fintan O'Toole in particular, Tessa Shishkovich, uh, talk about English nationalism as one of these key issues, or put in other terms, when deciding to go for a referendum that might lead to leaving, was disregard, to put it mildly, for the questions of the Union, and in particular, but we'll come to Scotland later on, and Wales, uh, in particular for Northern Ireland, and what it would mean for the hard-won peace uh, with the Good Friday Agreement uh, in, at Easter in 1998. Mm. Was, was this at all something that was sort of on the minds of people as the referendum was being fought about? Well, it was certainly on the minds of people who voted Remain. Mm -hmm. And the issue of the breakup of Britain was one of the issues that came up. And it's kind of weird because English nationalism isn't about having a separate England. I mean, English nationalism is about imperial nostalgia. It's about how we beat the Germans in the Second World War. It's about, um, so it, it's very much linked. You, it's very difficult to distinguish, to disentangle English nationalism from British nationalism. Mm -hmm. And what I find so unbelievably weird about the Leave campaign is that they don't seem to be at all concerned about it. They somehow don't believe it. They don't seem to take seriously. And it was interesting during the last round of negotiations, Boris Johnson goes to Ireland 
and is convinced by Varadkar, the Irish Taoiseach, that actually it would be bad for the Good Friday Agreement and therefore he should leave it. And obviously he'd just never given it any thought before. So it's like they've closed their minds from these sorts of issues. It's really weird because English nationalism isn't like Scottish nationalism or even Irish nationalism. It's, it's, it's about an empire. And so let, let's move, move to Scotland. Uh, Scotland had their referendum for independence. It, mm. it failed. Uh, the Scots decided to, to remain within the Union. And, and you said it yourself, one of the big issues that we're confronted with is exactly will the Union, will the United Kingdom remain united or are we looking possibly in a year, two or three to a re renewed Scottish referendum which uh, is being talked about? Do I think we definitely are. Mm -hmm. um, I think if Brexit happens, there's no question that Scotland will go independent, and if I were Scottish, I'd vote for independence too. <laughs> um, if it doesn't happen, I'm just not sure what's going to happen. Because I think if it doesn't happen, if we're going to overcome the polarisation in our society, we actually need devolution to English regions as well. I mean, I think it's fascinating that you look at these um, constituencies that are demographically exactly the same in Scotland and England. And, you know, there are abandoned mining and manufacturing towns in Scotland, but they voted remain in Scotland and voted leave in England. And I think part of that is the existence of the Scottish Parliament and the fact that you can, do have a feeling that you can make your voice heard in Scotland. Whereas in England, you just feel, com that was what we discovered from our local Brexit project. People just feel nobody ever listens to them. And so it you, seems- You often quote the indignados who say, we have a vote, but not a voice. Exactly. And that's what people feel very, very strongly. And um, I think that if Brexit doesn't happen, we are gonna have to have a real rethink of the whole, <coughs> the British non-constitution, <laughs> actually. Let me ask you uh, a question about the media and, and their influence. There's this, the, the stories are now, you know, well known that Boris Johnson was a journalist in Brussels of the Telegraph uh, 20, 25 years ago, and uh, he is quoted by saying that his editors would not publish w articles from Brussels that had anything positive that he would only be published if it was a Brussels bashing story. Mm. Uh, how much did this sort of uh, decades long, slow criticism of the EU and Brussels play into the hands I of I think it was incredibly important. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's no question that the Telegraph, the Sun, the Mail, you know, they all blamed everything on Brussels. And I think it had a big effect on people. One of the things that I find so interesting is that if you, the British <coughs> being a former colonial state <laughs> has a very active civil service. And I saw a figure, but now I can't remember where I saw it. But anyway, a very large number of regulations that have been introduced by Brussels have been proposed by Britain. The civil service love proposing regulations. <laughs> but because of our non-constitution, the executive, when it comes to relations with Europe, doesn't have to say anything to Parliament. So actually all these regulations were introduced without any domestic scrutiny. But in fact they were introduced by us, not by Brussels. But so it was really the lack of democracy in Britain that was important uh, as much as anything else. And so th the election, uh, as, as many pundits and uh, journalists are saying, is being pitted uh, is, is pitting the people versus the parliament or the, 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 po the, the political elite. How, how, how is that going to play out, you think? Will, will people buy that? 
I mean, Brexiteer, people voting for kind of getting Brexit done, do they believe in that, that somehow this mother of all parliaments has gone rogue and is not really representing the well, people? my impression when I went canvassing on Sunday <laughs> was that people were totally, those white working class people were buying it. But when you said, you know, they'd say things like, look, we voted for it, why don't we get it done? And I said, but we didn't know what we were voting for. And I think nobody would ever asked them those questions. They, they did start sort of looking at me. Mm -hmm. You could see their minds, you know, so I think a bit of argument is needed there. But I'm not sure how well it's going over as the people versus mm -hmm. parliament for various reasons. Mm -hmm. First of all, you know, Boris is clearly part of the establishment. He went to Eton um, and he's part of the Tories and he dare not go anywhere. Everywhere he goes, he gets attacked in hospitals, the floods. People shout at him and said, well, where were you? Why haven't you done anything? You're the Tories, we've had 10 years. Of so there's a lot of that going on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, you know, so you're not the people, you're the establishment going on. Um, so I'm not sure how well it's going. The other thing that is very, very clear that's happening is tactical voting on a huge scale. Can you explain that? Well, basically, I'm sponsoring a tactical voting site, and there are now about five or six tactical voting sites. Yeah. I think mine is the most looked at, okay. which tells you how to vote if your main concern is to get rid of the Tories and stop Brexit. <laughs> which means you wouldn't vote for your preferred party, but the one that's closest to you that might beat the Conservatives. Yes, and the problem with that is that in most cases it's Labour. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, a lot of people who are Remainers feel very dissatisfied with Labour's policy mm -hmm. on Brexit. And so therefore they're not, and particularly the Lib Dems are trying to paint Labour as a Brexit party, which mm -hmm. it isn't, but nor is it a clear Remain party. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us on that particular issue, what has happened to Labour that it isn't clear or perceived as not clear on whether it wants or doesn't want Brexit? The overwhelming majority of Labour Party members are against Brexit and want to remain. Okay. And uh, passionate remainers. And this is based on opinion polls or? It's of? been based on opinion polls, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, all sorts of things. People know that People this know. is the case. You, if you're Labour, you are anti-Brexit. Okay. <laughs> but the problem has come from the leader's office. It's come from two sources. It's come from Jeremy Corbyn and it's come from Len McCluskey, who is one of the big union bosses. And to tell you the honest truth, I don't know whether Jeremy Corbyn is remain or leave. I really don't know it. <laughs> I really don't know the answer to that question. But clearly his office are of the view that not, they're totally preoccupied with the northern working classes and want to win them back. And they're of the view that unless Labour's position is ambiguous, Labour won't win, which the rest of us think is quite the opposite. We think if if, he, if Corbyn had had a strong Remain position, we'd already have stopped Brexit a long time ago. So, but I think what has happened is there's been huge pressure from the grassroots on Corbyn. <laughs> so the position is much, much better than it was a year ago. Uh, at the last Labour Party conference, there were 60 resolutions calling for Labour to change its policy on Brexit. And I have never seen in my life such a Stalinist operation that went on really? in order to defeat these 60 resolutions. It was just incredible. I won't go into the details, but mm -hmm. basically they came up with a compromise. And as a matter of fact, I don't think the compromise is bad. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad. Labour is now the party that's in favour of a second referendum. 
uh, which is a huge step forward. And the policy is that uh, Labour will renegotiate the deal and it'll be more or less Norway plus, uh, which is customs union alignment with the single market, more or less staying in the European Union without being a member Remember. politically. And then Labour will put this deal to the vote. That's the policy, they say. And I think the other thing to mention before I s say something about it is that the interesting thing was they focused so much attention on the Brexit resolution, they didn't notice we had also put in a resolution calling for free movement of people. And that was won overwhelmingly. <laughs> And the consequence is that Labour Party's manifesto that was published today commits Labour to freedom of movement, which is a huge step forward. Yes. So that's, um, so that's, but so this is what, what they wouldn't do would be to, was to say they would campaign for Remain. They said it would, they would want to wait and see what the deal was like and then they would put it to a special conference where the Labour camp campaigns for Remain or, Lee, or, or for its deal. I think it's, almost, it's very improbable that they will manage to persuade Labour members not to be for Remain in such a... But it's for all these reasons that the other parties have said um, that... Uh, have said that Labour's not really a Remain party. <laughs> And of course, it was a real tragedy. If, if Labour had come out with this policy at the time of the European elections, mm -hmm. that was just terrible. Then the Brexit party would not have done so well and Labour would have done really well in the European elections and it would have changed the whole composition of the pa European Parliament. So it was a big tragedy that it's taken them so long to get to this point. And it also reflects, I, hate, I, I feel embarrassed to say, the sort of Stalinist methods of the people around Corbyn. So that's part of the story. Um, I think the other, um, the other worry about the Labour policy is that I think if we had a referendum not on a nice EEA deal, which means it's a win-win situation mm -hmm. because even if, even if Leave wins, it'll be a nice soft Norway option and those of us who like travelling to Europe and everything will still be, we just won't be able to participate politically, which is a stupid yeah. situation. But the other, the problem with that is that I think it's going to leave the Leavers feeling unrepresented. And I actually think a better option would be to have a vote on Boris's deal, because Boris's deal is a hard deal. Mm -hmm. It does want to leave the customs union and the single market. And I think people will would feel much more represented if the vote was on Boris's deal. So on that particular question, and you've alluded to it in, in the last thoughts that, that you've spoken, you know, whatever the result is in the end, you know, whether there's a Brexit, a softer Brexit, a Norway type Brexit. Will that help overcome the polarization? Because you said yourself the Leavers will not be happy if it's a sort of Norway, no. Norway deal. What, I how think, do you see that evolving? I think this is really difficult. And I think the only way... And this is where I actually do think Labour's position is good. I mean, Corbyn has said consistently he wants to overcome the polarization and bring Leavers and Remainers together. And I think the only way to do it is through a rethinking of our constitution. I think I really feel we need a new, a, a new deal, if you like, <laughs> about democracy. We really need to engage in discussions about the future of those left behind parts of Britain. We really need much, much more devolution, much, you know, it's not only that we don't have regional government in Britain, but also o over the last 30 years, local, fin local government finance has been completely undercut. It started with Thatcher and the poll tax, people may remember that. Yeah. 
And so municipalities have much less power, much less able to do things than in the past. Mm -hmm. So the British state has become an incredibly centralized state. And I think unless we address all those sorts of issues, it'll be very, very difficult to overcome that polarization. So uh, sort of um, subsidiarity in, in European Union jargon, giving more power to local authorities. Yeah, absolutely. So and of course that needs to be, it needs to be accompanied by reversing austerity. I mean, there've been huge inequalities I mean, that's true all over Europe, but I think it's at its most extreme in Britain. You know, we have some very people who have become extraordinarily rich and got richer after the financial crisis, while ordinary people paid for bailing out the banks and austerity. I mean, it, it is quite shocking. I mean, any, I don't know how many people have been in Britain recently, but the scale of the homelessness, the crisis in the National Health Service, um, the crisis in mental health, the crisis in, it's just in education. So, you know, you, you really have to reverse all of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, we, some of us were asked, uh, you know, what are the new walls that are going up after the Berlin Wall? Well, in 1989, a uh, colleague journalist, uh, Judy Dempsey, asked this question. And uh, one of the thoughts I had was exactly the, one, the wall that you're talking about, the, the, the wall between the 1% and the, yeah. and the 99% that doesn't seem to be abating. And I think Great Britain is just one of these examples that exacerbates, again, in, into the political field. And it field. literally leads to walls. The rich yeah. li live in... <laughs> in houses that are gated and secured because they don't, won't let anybody in and the poor are actually sleeping on the streets. Before we open it to, to our audience here, uh, one, one final question for me. Um, the, the book uh, takes, takes sort of the broader view. It's not in the weeds of, of Brexit. And that's, I think, part of its success is that we try to put it in a bigger context or rather you and, and the authors that are in here. Um, clearly, uh, something will change in the European Union. You're, you're a keen European yourself and, and have been. How do you see this affecting the European Union, Mary? Well, I think it already has, actually. During the referendum, there was a group of young people in Britain who formed, who were very frustrated by the way the Remain campaign was conducting its <coughs> campaign. And they formed a group called Another Europe is Possible. <laughs> and I was very excited about it and joined immediately and I've been very involved. In Always the activist. <laughs> at, I'm still an activist and it's lovely being with these enthusiastic young people. And, you know, we were quite pessimistic at the beginning about, um, you know, the possibilities for change. But actually, I think Brexit has already shifted. First of all, of course, in the UK, you've now got the strongest pro-European movement anywhere in the rest of Europe. If you, any of you have viewed the um, huge demonstrations we've had, uh, you know, it's extraordinary how, what a strong pro-European movement there is in Britain. But also, I think what happened, and this is what you saw in the last European elections, is that the right-wing populist parties decided they didn't actually want to leave the European Union. <laughs> Rather, they wanted to stay and create a Europe of the nations. And I think in trying to address that issue, the left, the Greens, have started to think more about how they need to address uh, the neoliberal character of the European Union, how they need to push for climate change, social justice, and actually the manifesto of the Party of European Socialists in the last election was, you know, did represent a new vision of Europe. And I do think the last European elections were the first elections where we've seen, it always was the case that European elections were 
really about local national issues and nobody took much notice of what was happening in Europe. And I really do think that is beginning to change. Uh, so I think Brexit's already had effect on Europe and I hope it will continue to do so. I mean, I, I'd like to see more happening across Europe. Yes, I, I, I think that uh, both, both Brexit and then Trump's victory in the US really had a kind of waking up moment yeah. for Europe where uh, a first member state decided it was going to leave was a shock, frankly, that anybody would contemplate that. And Europeans put their finger to their head and said, my goodness, what would it be if we did not have Europe? And the older generation, of course, immediately thought of the dark times and where you slide back. Mm -hmm. So it, it certainly had an immediate effect, but it's having an effect now on clearly on the on the Franco-German relationship and what is that sort of backbone of Europe without the UK in it. But anyway, I'll open it up to the audience now. And I think I saw Gaspar Miklos Tamas come in. So I'd like to recognize him as one of the nine authors. Gaji, thank you for joining us. Um, OK, first question here in the front row. Thank you very much. This was very en enlightening talk and encouraging in the first place, and that is very important. I have a question, first of all, regarding the Russian influence on the Brexit campaign. Uh, I read in the internet that you were a co-founder of a democ Open Democracy Net, yeah. and Open Democracy had a very thorough investigation in this case, and as far as I know, a report is on the table of Mr. Johnson, and it is not disclosed. Would it have an impact if it was disclosed and proven that there was a Russian influence on the Brexit campaign? Yeah. Do you want me to yeah, answer yeah, straight yeah. away? We have plenty of time. I mean, so. I have no doubt, you know, that there was Russian influence. And this report, obviously, they're suppressing it because of the evidence that there was Russian influence. The question is, would it make a difference? Yeah. And, you know, obviously if there was less messaging, less n there's no question that those white working class people that I was talking about are the subject to have an incredible amount of negative messaging. But what sort of strikes me when watching Boris Johnson or Donald Trump is that however badly they behave, nobody seems to mind. <laughs> you know, and I think that is the point really of, of them that's where their success lies they are they represent a license to behave badly so you can be horrible to women you can be horrible to blacks you can lie and people say to themselves well this is what we'd like to be able to do <laughs> and so for those sort of hardcore brexiters they, and it very much resonates, you know, my own work is on wars in places like the Balkans or Syria, you know, and these wars are wars where everybody breaks all the rules. And by breaking all the rules, they, a few people get very rich and a few people benefit. And I just think that, so my feeling is I'm not actually sure whether it would make that much difference any more than, I mean, it, any more than Boris Johnson lying or ha turning out to have masses of children by different women. We know all these things and it doesn't seem to affect that hardcore Brexit vote. But maybe those who are not so sure. That's what I hope. That's, and, and there I think you're right. I mean, I think there is, the Conservative vote doesn't only consist of hard Brexiters. Unfortunately, the party members are hard Brexiters, which is why they elected Boris Johnson. But I think there are a large number of Conservatives, people who vote Conservative because they don't, couldn't really bring themselves to be anything else. Uh, I think those people are the people we want to catch, and maybe those are the people who will vote, for instance, Lib Dem or something. So maybe that would make the difference. Right there. 
Well, also thank you so much for this uh, uh, very interesting um, discussion, especially uh, with respect to the uh, inner British uh, situation. But I was very glad f uh, about your last question, Ivan, because, uh, you know, I have to confess I'm Swiss, uh, as <laughs> somebody here know, and we don't even have the opportunity of Swexit because we are not in the union. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so why aren't we in the union? And how would, um, how would, uh, how would a similar uh, situation in Switzerland probably, um, in which result would it be resulting? And the answer is, it would be Swexit. Because we had a lot of these elections and they all were contra EU. And why is that? Is it because the Swiss are very nationalistic? I don't believe that, no. I think because, and that's why the last question was so important and your comment on it. I think because Europe didn't live up to the expectations. And I think that might be also a reason. Maybe there are good reasons to not want to join the union. Because it has become some sort of political correctness issue to be pro-Europe. Uh, and that probably uh, uh, led to the situation that the EU, as I said before, didn't live up to the expectations. It was just, it became a Euro Union. It was a, a monetary thing, right? And they didn't have any idea, and that's why I'm, again, glad that you answered the way you did, uh, that now people start to think about, uh, or already had started to think about a new idea of Europe. And that's, I think, necessary. Um, Brussels, as it used to be, is uh, nothing which is very charming. Everybody who has ever been to Brussels knows that. <laughs> and um, therefore, I think uh, maybe that discussion would m lead a little bit further than the most interesting internal issues uh, with respect to Great Britain. And I would be glad if you could comment on that a little bit. Mm. Just yeah. pass the microphone behind you. Yeah, yeah um, well, I think the Greek crisis was very decisive in that respect. I think people felt that Greek democratic aspirations were being um, ignored and um, that had a big effect, I think, on people in Britain, particularly people on the left. And there is what we call the Lexeter, the left wing Brexiteers who do think that um, the Euro European Union is unreformably neoliberal, that it's in the Maastricht Treaty, and you know we want to go it alone. <laughs> so there is that view. I would, and I I share the criticisms, uh, those criticisms, but I also think there are other sides to the EU. <laughs> I mean, I do think the EU has taken the lead on climate change. I do think the EU has had a different approach to external policy from NATO. Yeah. Um, and although I would like to see it much more assertive than it is, um, there are all kinds of areas where I do think the EU... So I don't think it's the whole story. That's number one. Mm. But Absolutely, I agree with you that that's what has to be reformed. But I also think, and that's where I disagree with the Lexiters, that in this totally integrated, interconnected world, um, it's not on to go it alone. I mean, the Lexiters think we can um, oppose austerity alone. <laughs> We just can't. We're subject to the vagaries of financial markets. We can't shift climate change. Again, I mentioned that today the Labour Party manifesto was published with a hugely ambitious programme for reversing austerity. Can it be done if Britain's outside the European Union? I have my scepticism about it. I think one difference for you in Switzerland and Britain is it's really difficult to imagine us being part of the single market, being part of the customs union, and not being able to participate in, the, in how, those, how those 
rules and regulations are made for a country like Britain. It seems completely mad. So I think that's really difficult. Because I think you, you know, we are, we, we've had it always. I mean, we have our own currency, so we're not subject to the euro. On the other hand, we've had more influence than anybody else on neoliberal, you know. Maastricht was Thatcher plus Delors, and Delors was the European, and Thatcher was the neoliberal. So the gentleman right there. Um, thank you very much to both of you. I too wanted to raise the issue of Russian interference <laughs> and the report. Because I really do believe that the British establishment more or less sleepwalked into the referendum for the very reasons that he outlined. Cameron was dead sure that he would win. He hoped that he would quieten down the, uh, the, 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 the extremist vote on the, on the right, but he didn't because they really didn't think it through. Hmm. They didn't even bother to campaign. But what I felt was uh, interesting was the the unison of purpose somehow or other between Murdoch and the conservative press that really encouraged the Leave campaign as much as they could, manipulated it as much as they could, and whatever Russian interference there may have been, whose strategic goal was to split the Union, the yeah. European Union. Hmm? I, I so that, that uh, connection is something that hasn't been explored sufficiently well, I think, and would be useful to explore. The, I, other, the yeah. other comment, if I just may quickly, um, you talked about the crisis of uh, politics and the, the particular breed of politicians it seems to have given rise to. I remember a former colleague of mine, Mark Malloch Brown, wrote this article that I'm sure you also saw in the Project Syndicate, where he compared the politicians that we see in Britain and in the US to the House of Cards series on Netflix. <laughs> and he said the interesting thing actually was that the characters in the House of Cards series came out much more positive than those in real life. I mean, that is an indication of something that yeah. you know, we, we clearly would not have expected even five years ago or so. So that would also be an interesting thing to hear from you, whether you, you believe uh, there is really something to be gained by, by behaving obnoxiously and purposely so, because you know that you are speaking the mind of so many others that have otherwise yeah. no voice. Huh? Uh, the last point, and then I stop. Twitter has become such a force and such a power, an unregulated power, that gives politicians a platform to reach millions in an instant, huh? to the point of interfering at the moment uh, in the hearing in front of Congress, where they can derail a proceeding with you know, 16 characters or whatever they type early morning in bed. Isn't it about time that we start regulating Twitter in one form or another? Well, I completely, I mean, I agree with everything you've said. The Russians, I think, it's extraordinary the way they pioneered what they call pol political technology. And again, in my field of war, you know, they started talking in 2013 this conception of nonlinear war, where you can destabilize a country without actually using military force. And um, it's extraordinary, you know, how successful they have been in manipulating opinion. But it's not only them. I mean, one of the big issues at the moment is this issue of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. And as a Jew who's been in the Labour Party all my life, I find it really hard to believe. I have no doubt that there are a few people who are passionately pro-Palestinian, <laughs> but it isn't the same thing as anti-Semitism. And how did this, and I really do think this was another case of political technology, that the Israelis also have, like the Russians, a sort of army of people who are manipulating Twitter. Um, I even have my doubts on, on the Russian thing. I'm, this may be me being totally conspiratorial, and perhaps I shouldn't even say it in public. But I do suspect uh, Jeremy Corbyn's chief of communications as being in the hands of the Russians, which may explain this whole policy. Uh, he's somebody who's been going to the Valdai Club and 
and all this kind of thing. Seamus Milne. And so I could go on at length about it, my conspiracy theories. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I agree with you, and I agree very much that we need to regulate. Um, and I think that's a lot of that. I mean, I think it was not just about the manipulation of, uh, you know, the report that Boris Johnson has refused to publish, the parliamentary report that you mentioned. But it was also about the financing. I mean, we know that the Leave campaign actually uh, broke the rules on financing. And the paradoxical thing is that had this been an election, we would have had to rerun it. But because a referendum is only advisory, <laughs> strangely, yes. it's just really ridiculous. But I mean, all this story about where they got the money from, uh, the money clearly came from Russia, a lot of the money for the Leave campaign. And even now, I was just read an article just today about where, who was getting all the money. And the Conservatives have already raised five million whereas the Labour Party's raised 200,000 from big donors. And, um, you know, there are a lot of Russian who are now British citizens who are providing a lot of money. Okay. There's a question right there in the middle. Yeah, there, gentlemen. We'll, we'll get, there's plenty of time, don't worry. Thank you. Um, I'm British if you like. I live in Britain and I'm desperate about the situation there. Simple question for you. Are we going to leave? <laughs> right, right next to you. Shall I continue? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, well, I wanted to go back to when you started off saying um, on migration, but also you, a sort of projection of underlying um, helplessness with social and economic change projected into two issues basically in Britain, one is migration, the other one is the EU, yeah? uh, which is a bit frightening that these projection <laughs> issues work so well. Yeah? It reminds one of the 30s, mm, no? Yeah. And uh, on the other hand, we have this helplessness of the left to deal with what they are supposed to deal with, namely <laughs> to uh, develop a policy agenda which deals or protects people from uh, in a distributive way or in a more forward-looking way to in relation to these uh, social and economic change challenges which we all live in. And the utter failure and helplessness <laughs> on the left to manage that. Uh, in fact, the other thing which I was uh, feeling very pessimistic about, uh, I, I agree that Brexit but also Trump, uh, the anti-EU feeling or the rise of the right has generated a rather strong movement in many countries. We see that also in Austria with the mm. votes for the Greens of a counter-reaction of a sizable, significant share of population which uh, feels re really worried about <laughs> mm. certain trends. But the worrying thing about it is that they are still contained within a, in, a, in a class level. <laughs> yeah on the more educated, the relatively well-to-do, uh, if one really looks sociologically on, on this group, which you also find very exciting here, <laughs> as a young euphoric, EU euphoric thing, how many working class kids are really joining that? And, and, and let me just, uh, well, at least uh, the sociological analysis in, in Austria or in Germany on the votes for liberals or, or the Greens would uh, support that, yeah? Uh, the most pro-European young people would actually not be necessarily uh, uh, widespread across uh, 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 across the social spectrum. So I think wh what the left has not managed is making exactly what Corbyn tries to do <laughs> in some way to make a bridge between these two rather different social groupings. No, on the, which I think historically was always an uh, ref uh, happened in the social democracy, professionals, urbans, intellectuals, and on the hand, other hand, working close vote. These two, these two um, bits of social composition are much, much more difficult to combine in a political agenda. If uh, you can, Nikki, if you can pass the microphone to Gazi over there, uh, Mary. Shall I go? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll come back to your question in a minute, but. Um, actually, I don't think that's true. 
the working class, the majority of the working class, in, I don't know whether it's the majority, I couldn't add it up, but the people who are in working jobs are what we in Britain call the BAME community, black, Asian, Muslim. And they're solidly pro-European. So it is actually a coalition <laughs> between middle class intellectuals and working class uh, black Muslim. And if you'd you know, been on the demonstrations, if you'd come to the what we called the left block, where the Greens and the Labour was, the majority of speakers were black or Asian or Muslim. So I, I don't think that is true, that it's a purely middle class phenomenon, and that gives me some hope. And uh, that was, is also my experience on the doorstep. So that's quite positive. And uh, in fact, there's an absolutely brilliant Labour, young Labour leader, who, well, he's not that young, but he's the shadow minister for sustainable economics. He's black, he was a soldier in Afghanistan, and he's very much, he started this group of MPs called Love Socialism, Hate Brexit. <laughs> and um, he's very charismatic. And he always says, you know, there's something, if you're black, you can feel there's something wrong about Brexit. So, you know, there's a whole new group of people who are pro-European, who aren't just middle class. Um, that's one thing. Then the question, <coughs> are we going to leave? Um, which, of course, nobody knows. And I daren't say, no, we're not going to leave just because it would be a hostage to fortune. Mm -hmm. But all we have to do in this election is to make sure the Conservatives don't get a majority. That's what we have to do. And then the other parties will, either we will have, a I think the most likely outcome is a Conservative Lib Dem coalition. And last night, the Lib Dems did say what I had always been expecting them to say that they would support <coughs> Boris's deal provided it was put to a referendum. And I think that's their way of saying they'd join a coalition with the Tories. Now, the worry about that approach, on the one hand, I think it would mean that we'd get a referendum <coughs> um, and it would be a referendum involving Boris's deal, which would make people feel less alienated, but with Boris in charge of the state machinery, you know, I'm not that confident of how well we do in a referendum. The other option is there's a minority Labour administration and uh, we go, so, and we go for Labour Party policy of some kind. Um, either of those options are quite probable. But if Boris win, and he's not doing well at all at the moment, he just is making a fool of himself the whole time. But they're hugely ahead in the polls. So the question is, if they win, it will be Brexit. I don't know what I'll do, leave the UK or whatever. But, uh, but uh, the hope is that we can deprive them of a majority. So we go to the back of the room now. You first, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so far, the discussion has been fascinating, and I hope I can add something to it. Um, I was made in England some time ago, um, exported to Austria, and I've been living here for over 30 years. I still hold a British passport, British UK, um, so I'm still a British citizen. And yet, because I've been abroad for over 15 years, I was not allowed to vote in the referendum. So my question is, um, first of all, where did this ruling come from? Secondly, where do I find it? Is it enshrined in law? Thirdly, is there any chance it might be lifted? Um, because we are the group, uh, we are a group of people who are the most affected. And by doing away with our votes, you're relinquishing and getting rid of 1.3 million potential voters. Can you pass the microphone over there, please, to Gazi? Yeah, right, yeah. Hello. 
Uh, hello. I have two children who are British, <laughs> and okay. they are just taking up Hungarian citizenship. <laughs> oh, gosh, I, I didn't want to do that. No, do you all say this? Oh, they want an EU passport. They I want plan, an EU passport, but I Hungary. didn't want to be part of the no, Orbán's no, no. Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> I, I live in Hungary, and that's enough. Okay. And, uh, but I wanted to, to, to uh, talk very, very briefly about something that is not so personal. Uh, this whole Brexit thing is fatally uh, reminiscent of uh, the breakup of the League of Nations at the end of the 30s. Because you see, uh, the whole international construction that has been established after 45, after 1945, that was about to, that was aiming at uh, precluding the repetition of what had happened in the 30s and precluding the possibility of a European war. And it is not only the EU that is in danger, but as you know, there are quite a number of uh, United Nations institutions from which the United States has already withdrawn. UNESCO, ILO, Climate uh, Agreement, etc., etc., etc. So there is indeed the outside forces that have stabilized Europe for 200 years since the Holy Alliance. Europe was always stabilized by the uh, British Empire and by the United States in the olden times after the defeat of Napoleon. And when anybody thought about the stability of Europe, nobody has ever imagined it without the cooperation of England and of America. So now for the first time since 1945, the continent has been left alone on its own without its super ego in uh, British and American liberalism, or whatever it is, constitutional system and constitutional sense and so on and so forth. So this is one of the most frightening consequences of a Brexit and of similar phenomena that we can observe uh, uh, in the uh, uh, constellation of the United Nations. So it is not only bad for England, I can't speak about Britain or United Kingdom any longer, because that's frittering away, and that is frightening in itself, too. <clears throat> but the consequences for us, it changes the balance of forces on the continent. If indeed the outside forces in the West are turning their backs on us, well, Putin isn't. Just gave a talk, I'm not one of those uh, mad Putin haters and conspiracy theorists or whatever. I think that Russia is an important country and we'll have to live with it as long as we still live uh, in this, on this continent. Nevertheless, he said something very interesting two days ago, that if the East European and the mid-European states will develop economically, they wouldn't want to pay for an enlarged Europe like the English didn't want to pay for a Europe they didn't like very much. So we'll see East European states leaving the European Union one after the other, said Mr. Putin two days ago. Well, of course, that's propaganda, but nevertheless, nevertheless, he may be right without intending to. He's just making trouble, but he may be more prophetic than he thinks he is. And so, you see, uh, the ripples started by the Brexit are being felt everywhere. Mm. You know, 95% uh, uh, of the Hungarian media are influenced in one way or another by the government. In these 95% of the media, the Brexiteers are presented as our heroes. No exception. And, uh, the, uh, and of course, the polls will show that in the Czech Republic and Hungary, et cetera, et cetera, people like the European Union and want to remain. 
but this is only refers to money. Otherwise, what has been called here political correctness, by which I understand, you know, progressive commonplaces and cliches and prejudices, most of which I share, uh, <laughs> those, <laughs> those, those are not popular. Those are not popular. And so I think that, that we are in a in, in great to do and, uh, and uh, so therefore it is in the interest of Europeans. I, I can't say about whether this is in the interest of the British, but it is in our interest that England should remain because this is in the interest of our stability and of the balance on the continent and also our habits. Have you ever thought about it, that England is leaving the European Union, an international organization that speaks English? According to the present rules, this can't be continued. And French and German as word languages don't exist any longer. I belong to that old generation that still speaks French and German, but I'm very lonely. <laughs> that everybody speaks only, only English, and so you know, so there will be European Parliament meetings where everybody will speak the language of a member state that has departed. <laughs> yeah, um, that shows something. I, okay, I interrupt myself. If you can pass the microphone back, please. <laughs> Do you want me to? Yeah, yeah. So I feel a great deal of sympathy on this issue of the 15-year rule, which is, seems to me terribly unfair. Equally unfair was the fact that European Union citizens weren't allowed to vote in the referendum because they have been also deeply affected. And um, I've looked into it already before, and with no positive outcomes, I'm afraid for English friends living in other parts of Europe. I've, so many people have talked about it. The st manifesto that Labour came out with today committed to all residents having the right to vote and all British citizens abroad. So maybe that, but at least it's now on the agenda. <laughs> um, on, I don't know whether I agree on these very big points that Gaspar Miklos has been making. But uh, what I do notice is that I do think already Brexit has had a very bad effect on EU external policy. I can give you two examples. I mean, one is the Horn of Africa, where the British were leading the anti-piracy mission in the Gulf and were pushing for the UN presence, which was funded by the EU in Somalia. And that's been really important. Absolutely. But now the British are no longer there. The French want to use the money in Mali, where they've got a sort of more of a war on terror going on. And, the, and I think that's really been very bad for the Horn of Africa. That's one issue. Uh, another issue is Syria. I mean, the Germans just, r it's outrageous that Turkey, which is a member of NATO, nobody has put pressure on Turkey to stop the behavior uh, that's going on. And the Germans did come out with a proposal for trying to restrain uh, Turkey and put UN or your EU peacekeepers into, uh, in order to protect the civilians in northeast Syria and to protect the ISIS camps. But nobody's taken it up. And in another era, the British would have been enthusiastically on board for this. So I think it's having a very bad effect Absolutely. on foreign policy already. And I feel very pessimistic because I do think the European Union has represented very importantly a, a force for a different kind of approach to international relations. It has been about how do we extend an international rule of law? How do we extend human rights? Uh, but it needs to be given what's happening in the United States and elsewhere. It needs to be much more forceful, and it isn't. 
And I think the British were quite important in that. I wouldn't like to over-exaggerate the British role, which the British like to do. But I nevertheless think, I, I, I think it's also a problem for the British because, you know, there's this somehow this myth that we're going to be incredibly powerful outside the European Union. And actually, what with the breakup of Britain and the little England, uh, certainly I don't know what's going to happen to all these people who used to be Eurocrats and active. In, so, you know, it's going to be very bad for Britain too. Absolutely. There's a lady back there. Uh, thank you. Many thanks again uh, for your inspiring analysis and, and thoughts. And I would have a question regarding, I hope I'm, I'm uh, understandable. Um, I would have a question. Is it better now? Uh, yeah. uh, I would have a question regarding Euroscepticism, EU skepticism throughout Europe, because there are uh, current debates uh, in which theorists uh, emphasize that uh, it's not up to date uh, anymore uh, to divide uh, um, uh, uh, tendencies in uh, pro-European and anti-European, uh, but it should be more divided. It's, it's a discourse uh, which is uh, 20 years old, and at the moment, uh, the, the older tendencies and developments should be analyzed much, much more concrete, and those theories also claim for uh, uh, developing new narratives of Europe. You also mentioned it, and, and I, I would like to ask you uh, how these narratives uh, could be developed uh, when thinking also on, on Visegrad uh, countries, and then you also mentioned countries which should be integrated, EU candidate states, uh, which, which are in a uh, permanent present time of never entering uh, the EU uh, sphere. And, and how, could, how would you think uh, those frustrated you mentioned also before, uh, also throughout Europe, uh, could be reached and picked up? Well, uh, two things I'd like to say. First of all, it's interesting to me that it's young people on the periphery of Europe who are most pro-European. <laughs> so the Ukrainian protesters, the Bosnian protesters, they're the ones that are really pro-European. Uh, and I once, interestingly, attended a meeting of <coughs> activists in Sarajevo, and there was a young German activist who attacked the Ukrainian activists for calling themselves Euromaidan and saying, look, don't you know that the European Union is this horrible neoliberal institution? Why didn't you call yourself Social Maidan? And the Ukrainian was very interesting in activist in defending the European position and saying, for us, it's, you know, we're concerned about crony capitalism, we're concerned about corruption. Belonging to the European Union is all about transparency and rule of law and all of these kinds of issues. And similarly, the Bosnian activists described themselves as the avant-garde of Europe. Now, in that period, which was sort of early 2000s, we, we did a study, actually 2011, of sort of that, that was the time of Occupy and of all sorts of new movements, Podemos, Syriza. And when you talk to them, they were utterly uninterested in Europe. They didn't mention Europe. Their concerns were entirely with social justice, social issues, and Europe seemed irrelevant. When you pushed them a little bit, they were divided. There were those who said Europe's neoliberal. There were others who say Europe's just part of our lives. We're the easy jet generation. We're the Euro generation. But I think it's that which has really changed in, as a consequence of Brexit. I think more and more young people especially realize that freedom of movement is very precious, that it's very precious to be able to study and work and have relationships across Europe. I think that's something that certainly in, in, in um, Britain this was the case. But also I think there is a growing realization that if we are to confront climate change, if we are to confront austerity, we can only do it on a European basis. 
And so in that sense, I'm much more optimistic that there is a new generation. I think it would be, it's really important to bring together young people from the different parts of Europe and particularly with the people on the periphery, the Bosnians and the Ukrainians, to understand why Europe is so important for them. Uh, and final question here. <coughs> Thank you. I have a question. When you go canvassing, what do people talk about? What do they care about? You said at the beginning that uh, major political parties did not uh, uh, have distanced themselves from the people. What do people talk to you about? It depended who you talked to. I mean, the students, we discussed tuition fees. And, um, you know, the Tories introduced tuition fees. University used to be free. And so a lot of the, st and the Labour Party is committed to abolishing tuition fees. But a lot of the young people said, oh, it's idealistic, it will never happen. And I had to say, but when I was young, I didn't pay tuition fees. Why is that idealistic? Um, the big, big issue, and there was a poll published yesterday, 60% of the population feel the National Health Service is more important than Brexit. So the NHS is hugely important, housing is hugely important, and climate change. Climate change is a big issue. But I think what's sort of so interesting is that those white working class people I was talking to, for them Brexit is the issue, even though they don't seem to really know what Brexit means. It's become a sort of ideology yep. that overwhelms all the other issues and to try to persuade them that they should be It's like a panacea that Brexit will solve all their problems. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's just a kind of mad fantasy. I feel, and that is the problem we face and the problem that we really have to confront, which is really, really difficult. And of course, I mean, even when the Leave decision happens, there will be a trans so-called transition period before there's a negotiation on ag actually what the relations will be. Well, and that's what I keep trying to, you know, one of Boris's mantra is, I'm the only person who's going to get Brexit done. But actually, this is only the withdrawal agreement. It's only the precondition to the negotiations on trade. So actually, if Boris's deal is passed, we will have years and years and years of Brexit discussions. So the idea that he's going to get Brexit done is completely cloud cuckoo land, but it's terribly difficult to get that argument across. Well, there's irreversibility. Oh, is it reversible? Well, that's a question we've all been asking ourselves. Is it reversible? We have a transition period for two years. Couldn't we reverse it during that transition period? Well, um, many, many questions open. Brexit continues in, in <laughs> many, many shapes and forms. We may uh, be back in the 2090s still discussing uh, Brexit. I, <laughs> I do recommend uh, picking up and buying the book. I'd just like to remind you once again, uh, Mary will be talking about a lot of these European questions tomorrow at the Odeon Theatre. And on Sunday, we'll actually be talking about these questions of the nascent state and transnationalism. So please join us. But before we leave, uh, join me in thanking Mary for coming and being with us. Thank you.